<laughs> so what I want to talk about today is animal doctors and not the kind of doctors that help animals, but animals being doctors. And I tied up my talk from Monarch MD to potential users. So let me ask just in this room, how many students are actually on the pre-medical track? So I know we have a good number of students at Emory. Most of my advisees are, right? And, and so the, the idea is most, most students actually have noble reasons to do that. But there must be some that want to be a famous doctorate. And I like, I like to do Google searches because Google knows everything and we all know that. And um, so this is what you get when you search for famous doctors in Google. And it's kind of disappointing, <laughs> right? There's actually, there's actually very few real doctors in here. And, and so, so the point here is, so you may, you may spend $200,000 on a medical degree, but Dr. Eva will still beat you. Right? <laughs> so really what I want to talk about is less famous doctors and doctors that don't have these aspirations of beating Dr. Eva. And so we have examples in the animal world, and that's really going to be the, the topic of today. Can we look at the animal world and look at non-humans, see how they practice medicine, and actually maybe learn from them? And I think it's safe to assume that most people in this room have heard of chimpanzees, have even seen them. Um, most people have heard of honeybees, but I bet you there's very few people in this room who have heard of wood ants and maybe even weirder than that, woolly bear caterpillars. And these are all animals and what we're finding out is that these animals use medicines that they find in the environment they live in and that they may actually use to fight their parasitic diseases. So what I'm going to talk about is twofold. I'm going to um, really focus heavily on, on this guy here, the monarch butterfly. And so that is really going to be the main part of my talk. Talking about medication in monarch butterflies, that's really the work we do. And then after that, I'm going to look at it a bit more broadly and say, you know, what other examples do we find in nature? What sort of animals do medication and what can we learn from them potentially? So monarch butterfly is very famous, very well known here in North America and most people know them for this spectacular migration that they undertake from North America to Mexico every year. And they really go in hundreds of millions of butterflies down to the Mexican overwintering sites. This is a picture I took, and you can really see the trees covered in these monarch butterflies, really layers upon layers of butterflies. So, and this is really attractive. A lot of people really like monarch butterflies, and some of them dress up like monarch butterflies. <laughs> so we have, we have a lot of festivals around monarch butterflies because they're very popular. So in order to understand medication, we need to go back to our childhood. And actually what I'm going to point out is that you shouldn't really believe everything your parents tell you or children's book tell us. And so as you all know, the hang very hungry caterpillar is actually been translated into very many languages. And of course, this caterpillar gets a tummy ache from eating all these foods, including sausages, ice creams, and melon and everything. And of course, it should get a tummy ache because caterpillars don't do this. And that's my whole point. The point here is, that most caterpillars are very specialist feeders. And this is certainly true for the monarch butterfly. And so here you see the monarch butterfly caterpillar depicted on a milkweed. And milkweeds are species of, of plant. There's about 150 species of it um, in North America. There are about 30 species that monarchs can use. And, but they're specialized on these milkweeds. These are the only species they can use. Here's just a few examples. And what makes milkweeds interesting is that they contain chemicals called cardenolites. They're actually toxic. If we eat milkweeds, we actually get sick. And here's some, for the chemists in the room, some chemical structures of them. What is interesting about it is that monarchs are quite resistant to them, but they also take them up in their own bodies. They sequester them into their tissues, and that makes them sick. And so when you look back at some really cool experiments that Lincoln Brower did in the 1960s, he would rear these monarchs in different species of milkweed, some more toxic than others, and then measure how long it takes for birds to throw up, right? And it actually turns out that the more toxic the plant was that the caterpillar used, the quicker the monarch butterfly throws up. And it's important because these chemicals will play a role in the medication story that I'm about to tell you. So for monarchs, as with many other animals, the life cycle starts with a copulation act. And in monarchs, that is not really flowers and chocolate. It's actually not very romantic at all. The males really grab onto the females and drag them around until they're satisfied and have transferred their sperm. And this can take up to 30 hours. So it's really not very nice for the female really, you know, being dragged around. <laughs> and then what you get, this is really the important thing, the female laying an egg. So the female, again, they're specialists. They seek out milkweeds, lay an egg. And from the egg comes the caterpillar. Um, the females can lay several hundreds of eggs in their lifetime. And then you get five instars of larvae. They really eat a tremendous amount of milkweed during their lifetime and then turn into the pupa. And here we get the real metamorphosis from the caterpillar into the adult butterfly. And what we tend to think when we think about monarch butterflies, these are sort of the pictures we see. 
you know, this is in Mexico, I waited for the sunlight to come through these <coughs> wings, and we get this very rosy picture, right? But actually, when you look at monarch butterflies, less than 1% of those eggs actually turns into an adult butterfly. They have a lot of menaces and a lot of threats in their life, and one of them is a very interesting parasite called Ophiocystis electroscira, and this is just a, a picture of it showing spores that they form. And this is not the typical picture of a monarch butterfly you see. This butterfly is really sick really disgustingly sick, it's stuck to its pupil case, and it's basically what happened is that these parasites have made holes in the abdomen, so the butterfly's oozing bodily liquids and gets stuck to the pupil case and will never fly. And so sometimes we like to call this jelly belly syndrome, there is no real name for the disease, just for the parasite. And so some monarchs actually get through this stage, but it's really detrimental, they may be smaller, they don't mate as well, they don't fly as well, so there's really a lot of problems for the monarchs when they're infected with this disease. And this is really why I study monarch butterflies, because they get sick. I'm really interested in parasites, and to me this is a really cool parasite. Right? So when you're a parasitologist, you get excited about nasty things, and this is one of those. <laughs> so the, the life cycle works. So we start with an infected butterfly, and she will carry millions of these parasites that just sit on the abdomen. And then when she lays an egg, she transfers those parasites to the eggs. You see here on the right is an egg that really has tons of these parasites sitting on it. And then the caterpillars, what they do when they get out of that egg is eat up the eggshell, and this is how they eat up the parasites, they get infected, and then you get parasite growth during the pupal stage, and you see these lesions here on the pupae, that is where the parasites are forming. And you can infect a caterpillar with a single spore, and the adult that comes out of it will carry millions of these spores again. So very detrimental. So what we're really interested in is understanding how the different milkweeds that monarchs use can really take care of this parasite, right? And so, so we often hear these science stories, you know, that like we know what we're doing, and, and it just in terms of inspiration and so on, I'd like to point out that this whole project was kind of born out of, of um, you know, an accident. I just said, I just want to rear different species of milkweed in the greenhouse and see what it does to the parasite. So we use two species, uh, swamp milkweed on the left, and then on the right we have tropical milkweed, feed the monarchs, these, cat, these milkweed species and see what happens to their parasites. And so what I'm going to show you here on the left is really how long the monarchs live when they don't have the parasite, depending on the different species of milkweed. And so when you rear them on these species, you see that they live about the same amount of time on the two species. And then we infected them with four different strains of the parasite, indicated there on the x-axis, and then see how long the monarchs live when they're infected. And what we can really see is that the monarchs live a lot shorter when they're infected. We already knew that. But in the yellow bars, those are the monarchs that were reared on the tropical milkweed. And we can see these tropical milkweed have a medicinal effect. Those monarchs live much longer than the monarchs reared on the swamp milkweed. So they're doing much better. And part of the reason for this is that those milkweeds have much higher levels of these cardenolites that I already mentioned. This is a collaboration with the University of Michigan. Um, and they don't have just more overall levels, higher levels overall, but also much wider diversity of these chemicals. So you can see in yellow, these are all tons of different chemicals that these plants have. And we really think these are playing a role in medicinal properties of these milkweeds. And we followed up this work by looking across 12 species of milkweed. And what we can see when we do that is when the cardenolite concentration increases in the species, the monarchs start living longer and longer when they're infected with this parasite, up to a point where it goes down again. And we think this is actually similar to human drugs, where we use the drugs, they help us against disease, but they also have side effects. So when there's too much of the drug, it can actually be bad for the monarch. So having done all this, we said, would it just not be really interesting if these monarch butterflies could use this, right? We feed them different species, and we see that some are medicinal um, and some are not. Can we actually find that the monarch can take that knowledge? Do they know what is going on? Can they preferentially use the medicinal milkweed? And I remember writing this in the first paper that we wrote on this whole topic. And one of the reviewers, so we undergo peer review in science, and one of the reviewers said, well, that's just a crazy idea. You know, we learned this morning that you shouldn't say crazy. She said that that is just not a very good idea, <laughs> or you jerk, or something like that. But the point is, we said there is nothing as motivating in science as a reviewer that you want to prove wrong. So we said, let's, let's just go for it. So what we did, we had two hypotheses. First hypothesis is that the caterpillars actually preferentially um, ingest more of the medicinal milkweed when they are given a choice. And the second hypothesis is that it's not the caterpillars, but their mothers that make the choice for them. You know, everyone knows that, that mothers know best. I mean, mothers are very, really the smartest creatures in the world. And we thought that was the more likely hypothesis because the mothers really 
put the eggs on a plant, right? And so they really determine what the caterpillar is gonna eat. The caterpillars in nature don't have very much choice themselves. So we did the experiments. The first one we did, we gave monarchs the choice between piles of milkweed, the medicinal and the non-medicinal milkweed, and then calculate how much they ate of each species over their lifetime. And what we found, very boring result, that the caterpillars really don't care at all. Whether they're infected or not, they derive 50% of their diet from the medicinal milkweed when they're infected, 50% when they're uninfected. They really have no preference whatsoever. So that was boring but not unexpected. And then we went to the more exciting result. We took our monarch butterflies, infected some, left others infected, put them in a cage, and in the cage we had a medicinal plant and a non-medicinal plant, and then we would count the number of eggs laid within a two-hour frame. Right? It's, it's not rocket science. Most people in this room could do it, and that's kind of cool about it. And then what we said is, so let's look at the proportion of eggs that these monarchs laid on the medicinal milkweed, and this time we found a very stark effect. So on the left here is the infected monarch butterflies, and we found that they're twice as likely to lay their eggs on the medicinal milkweed, whereas the uninfected butterflies had no preference whatsoever. They didn't really care when they laid those eggs. So really what we see here is that these infected monarch butterflies that are sick with the parasite prefer to lay their eggs on a medicinal plant. And what's interesting about it is that these females cannot cure themselves of the parasite. They already suffered it during their, their childhood, if you like, and they cannot prevent the transmission of the parasites either. But what they can do is really reduce the infection and the disease in their offspring by laying the eggs on the right plant. And so that really made us think that's really interesting because people think about chimpanzees and other clever animals doing a lot of this medication, right? But what we have here is, is, is an organism that not many people would find very smart or cognitively able can do this. You know, there's some innate responses here that these animals can use. So the next thing we did was say, let's put this all together and let's actually see what people are finding these days. And we wrote a little review of this. This just came out less than two weeks ago. And really putting this all together, and what it turns out, you can actually find a lot of examples. There's actually the last few years, we find examples of medication, for example, in, in fruit flies, in these woolly bear caterpillars, in ants. And of course, there's examples from primates, including baboons and chimpanzees. And when you look at all this evidence, really there's a few lessons that you can learn. And the first is that you really don't need those big brains. Animals don't really have to be very smart. They don't have to be like us to be able to use medicine. We should also de-emphasize the self in self-medication. I think that's important, and I think that for a long time people haven't opened their eyes to <coughs> medication in animals because they haven't looked broadly enough. What we find with the monarch butterflies is that they cure their offspring of disease. We see this with other animals, including fruit flies as well. So there can be actually motherly care or care for relatives instead for the individual doing it for themselves. Um, we also found that most studies at the moment are still suggestive. You know, and we don't have the real evidence that they are evolved forms of medication. So we need more research, but it's really promising to see a lot of these examples already. And then there may be some interesting consequences for humans, and I just want to spend the last few minutes on, on that question. And we have known this for a while. Again, if you look at mammals, and there are tribes in, in Africa, for example, in Tanzania, where we know that certain treatments that people use are based on what animals do. One example is based on elephants, <laughs> where elephants actually use some kind of cold water concoction to take care of stomach upset, and people have copied this. And another example of a porcupine that was observed to dig up the roots of a particular plant because it had bloody diarrhea, and that is now being used by the people as well. Right? But what I would really like to, to argue is that we should look at this more broadly and go to you know, animals that are, are less likely in our eyes to do these things and just be open-minded, look at tons of animals. And one more example is in honeybees. Honeybees are known to collect resin, and resin is a sticky excretion of a lot of plant species. They collect it, and they put it in their nests. And what this does is it actually reduces microbial growth, and it can prevent infections with all sorts of parasites. And there's two important um, aspects to this example. The first is that what beekeepers have done over the years actually select against this medication behavior. And the reason is that this stuff is really sticky and it makes it hard to open up hives. And so people have actually selected against this medication. And whether that is, you know, one of the reasons why we see so many problems in the bees right now, we don't know. But it's certainly a possibility. But the other lesson that we can take from there, we can look at such, a, such an organism, an insect, and see what do, they, what do they collect. And it turns out that resin that they collect contains a lot of chemicals that actually act against parasites. And some of the chemicals have been shown already to act against human viruses in vitro. 
right? So really the conclusion of uh, what, what I want to bring out here is that we should forget just about all these clever animals, you know, and these, these animals with big brains, <laughs> and really start exploring nature more and look at all these obscure insects. This is a Google search for obscure insects, which is a bit more accurate than the famous doctor search. But really, you know, go for it. Be interested in nature. Go out there, follow these tiny insects, all these crazy, sorry, all these little <laughs> awkward animals, and, um, you know, see what they do and see if we can use it. Thank you so much.